Hello and welcome to another lab on this one on acidosis. Rocky's here to help me. Your pH is what you eat and much, much more. So there I am, your hostess with the mostess. Hopefully you know who I am by now. And you know, we had a talk about how tall we are. That's about how tall I am. All right, so in the other lab, eight, you are making cabbage juice or beet juice or some kind of juice and testing pH. And what you're gonna find is if you test fruits and vegetables, they're gonna test out on the acidic side and all those soaps and alkaloids, they're gonna test out on the alkaline side. But that's not actually what happens in your body because in our body, it's actually all the fruits and vegetables are not actually acidic. So there is what's considered normal pH. So seven is not actually neutral in our body. In our body, neutral is actually slightly alkaline, 7.35. You can be a little bit below that and you're still alive, but you feel like crap. And that is acidosis. If you go above the normal range, 7.35 to 7.45, that's alkalosis. And you go too far outside of this, well, you actually go first into a coma. Your brain pretty much turns you off and says, you've screwed up. Let's see if we can get back things in order. And so you take anatomy, go into nursing school, whatever, you learn all these big fancy words about metabolic acidosis, but really it comes down to this. Your blood can be acidic, your blood can be slightly alkaline. And again, it's not seven we're comparing to, it's 7.35. And so normal is always being slightly above, slightly in the alkaline range. Below 7.35 is what most Americans are in the state of chronic acidosis. And that's what their blood looks like. And that is because Americans eat crap. Carbonated drinks, refined sugars, artificial foods, and processed foods. This all decreases your pH below the 7.35 as shown in the kidneys down there at the bottom. It has to do with that beautiful ion bicarbonate. And if you eat the rainbow, your blood will be alkaline, lovely, and a pinkish hue. So there's papers out, actually I have a reference on this slide, about diet-induced metabolic acidosis. And so it's actually a paper I read 20 years ago, long before this paper, about that Americans are in the state of chronic um, metabolic acidosis based on our diet. And now there are more and more papers slowly coming out, but what it causes being slightly acidic, again, just slightly below that 7.35, is your bones, your body tries to buffer it, and the way it buffers it is with calcium. And so it pulls calcium out of your bones. The cause of osteoporosis is acidity. And so the calcium then gets stuck in your joints, and you have creaky joints. Your bones now have lost mass and you have all these bone fractures and all this calcium's in your joints and you're like the tin man. And your kidneys then have to deal with all this extra calcium and your kidneys aren't doing so good. The IR moving across is insulin resistance. Yes, there is a definite uh, connection to diabetes and pH and cortisol stress, high levels of stress, like the cowardly lion who is always in a state of stress, actually leads to acidosis and high blood pressure and all these other things going on. Yeah. And so this equation at the top of the page is really important. When you take anatomy, I'm sure you learn about it. Um, so based on our breathing, we can regulate CO2, which is way over on the left side here. And if you, you can regulate, so um, the bicarbonate in your diet 
And that's where the fruits and vegetables and eating the rainbow comes in. They're very high in all these minerals and bicarbonate. So even though when we test them in the test food, they're acidic, when our body eats them, they're actually alkaline because of this release of all these minerals. So beyond all the phytochemicals, all the minerals, especially bicarbonate. And the number one source of bicarbonate is potatoes. And this is a picture of the high potato fields. I think it's Alubari. Uh, so Pimba took us there when we were in Nepal 10 years ago. And you can see, so this is in the Himalayas. And it was very, um, it was very beautiful. And I'm pretty sure no white person has ever been there or ever will be again, but um, it was just beautiful. So Pimba decided we needed to go meet the goat and yak herders. And so we went up with our backpack, with just our sleeping bags, and just our lunch. And we got to the goat herder's house. And we waited for him. And then he showed up with his goats. There they are. Look at those horns on those goats and the baby goats. And they were so happy and they loved us. And they let us stay there for the night. And he even cooked for us. Those are wild mushrooms. And we slept in the little, that little place. And we were so warm and we slept so beautifully. And then we woke in the morning to this view, for real. It was like the glory of God to the highest. And then he gave us milk. He gave us fresh goat's milk. He went and milked the goats and fed us before the baby goats. There's Pimba actually in that picture. And then the ponies came up. The ponies came up because the ponies would get the goat dung and carry it down because there were apple orchards down where all the regular everybody else was. And the goat dung was the secret behind the apple trees and why they had so many amazing apples. That's a whole nother story. And then the goat herder sent us to find the yak herder. So we went along and Pimma picked mushrooms and we found the yak herder. Well, the yak herder wasn't there. See, it's pretty much a little cave. And Pimma just said, okay, we're gonna stay here. And I was very dubious that we could all fit in this little cave, but we did. The yak herder showed up and there he is cooking for us. This is all he has. They were so hospitable. And so while we're here sitting there on Amazon ordering everything left and right, I have to have this, I have to have that. I have never known hospitality like I did when we were up in the Alubari, the high potato fields with the yak and the goat herders. And they fed us. For several days and then he actually told us we had to go with him i i couldn't understand anything because it was all in nepali but we had to go up mati to his hire this is like the um yeah the the yaks had gone higher because the weather had moved up and so we went to this place and and these walls are held together i guess what the dung the goat dung and the yak dung holds all the walls together isn't that awesome? They're so useful. And then on our hike, we found the blue poppy. Very rare. Nobody sees blue poppies, but we found one. And we found the golden butterfly. They're only found at really high altitudes. And yeah, that wasn't doing very well. And then we found the axe. There's the axe. And then we kept climbing eventually. And we went over the Thor, the, we went over the rainbow. And there's our Sherpa. Yeah, if you notice, Joey and I have no bags on because we got to a certain height and I was not doing well. And so Pimba just took my bag and threw it over his bag. And we went somewhere over the rainbow. And that's where it is. And on the other side of the rainbow is Manang. And the best food of all time. The greatest food of all time. Yes. And while we were there, we only ate the rainbow. Because they had no crap. They only had real food. But when you come back to this country... What kind of rainbow do people eat? Oh, this artificially flavored, highly pure sugar. Whether it's Skittles, M&Ms, yeah, everything's rainbows. We're obsessed with the rainbows and it's making us sick because of all the sugar. Sugar destroys your brain. Two commercial baked goods per week. Two doubles depression. Most people are eating two per day. This is not the homemade, made with love from your heart. Made where you control what goes in. This is the extremely highly processed commercial baked goods. Can't eat that crap because it's crap. And there is a definite link between sugar and depression. Why? 
Now you can understand this slide. Oxidative stress, free radical. Remember the octet? Remember our pairs of electrons? That guy in the middle, red dude, he is miserable because he's missing an electron. And so he's seeing, he sees an electron from the stable molecule, the green guy. But unbeknownst to him, what's in all your fruits and vegetables are some extra electrons. And the antioxidants coming along to put it there. This oxidative stress also, well, first let's talk about the dopamine. Is too much sugar overstimulates dopamine, and then your dopamine response becomes less. So it's just like a Coke addict, and you just need more sugar. And there we go, there's the shrinkage of the brain. Oh my goodness, but you know what's the best part? You can reverse it. You can make your brain look beautiful and yeah, and functioning by eating nutrient dense foods, fruits and vegetables, all those beautiful colors, Roy G. Bibb, high in phytochemicals. Supplements don't have that effect. It has to be the whole food comes back to the vibes, babe. It's all in the vibration. So back to acidosis is your fruits and vegetables are alkaline to your body. And the sugar makes it acidic, pulls the calcium from your bones, you get deposits everywhere, and then your health just declines and you feel like crap. But it's not just the sugar and the processed. Look at all these acidic foods. The ones I'm circling there, oh, animal-based food. Animal-based protein is highly acidifying. Plant-based protein is not, as long as it's not processed. So the soy isolate is processed, but whole soy is actually very alkalinizing. So high-protein diet, yeah, these diets are fats, and they disappear every five years, and then a new one comes along because it takes about five years for the people, they feel good, they lose weight, because they take them off of crap and put them on high protein or high fat, but the problem is they're killing themselves inside, and so people start dying, they become sick. The average American eats twice as much protein as is recommended. Where did all these myths come from that we need that much protein? Who's got all the clout? Who's got all the money to convince you of that? What does the protein do? It acidifies your blood. Leaches calcium from the bones, leading to osteoporosis, fractures, calcium deposits in your joints, you get arthritis, and cancer. Cancer loves acid. Cancer lives on acid. Cancer does not survive when you are in this slightly alkaline, the 7.35 to 7.45 bliss. Below 7.35, chronic metabolic acidosis, cancer cells thrive. Degenerative diseases, so this gentleman, one of the best books ever. Uh, so T. Colin Campbell did the studies back in the 80s, I believe, 80s and 90s. Uh, and our degenerative diseases are linked to the high protein diet. And I believe then because of the acidosis, 17-fold increase in heart disease, in breast cancer, and other cancers, and your kidneys have to get rid of, since we're getting twice as much amino acids as our body needs. We have to get rid of twice as many nitrogen, because our body doesn't need the nitrogen, and it's your kidneys that get rid of all that nitrogen that's in the amino acids. And if you're eating protein, you're gonna be constipated you're gonna feel like crap, because you're filled with crap. And ketosis is a myth. It's ketoacidosis. As I mentioned, cancer loves acids. They also love ketones. And so cancer always travels to the liver because your liver is where ketones are made. And so we're putting people on this diet where we're saying, hey, let's feed cancer cells. And guess what? The statistics are coming out. It took a couple of years for the cancers to start and for the heart disease to start. The keto diet is going away because people are getting really sick from it. And eating the high animal protein, exposure to toxins, antibiotics. Oh, and this is a big deal right now and all the time. It suppresses your immune system, as does sugar. A teaspoon of sugar, your immune system goes down to half for six hours. 
again is harsh on mama earth it's a whole nother topic so alkaline blood this time is on the left of our screen look at those immune cells look at the acidic blood again this the, the left side is the 7.35 carrots cabbage and the acidic blood is oh the pepperoni and bacon look at those immune cells i don't think those immune cells will work look at the fungus in this there's fungus and look at the red blood cells they look like little ninja stars something's not right they're not going to flow correctly you're going to feel like crap and this is the best part our government in their wisdom says well it's okay if 25 percent of your diet is crap junk really then even sadder 95 percent americans can't stay within the 25 percent junk food guideline you should not be eating 25% junk food. This is what Americans eat. Standard American diet, chronic systemic metabolic acidosis. That first lecture, it's all coming back around. 51% processed food is the average American. This numbers have actually gotten worse. The new numbers I saw, the fruits and vegetables were less than 5%. Just go to the store and look at people's grocery carts. Yeah, it's sad. And there we go. You just feel like crap. You're acidic. And there's, yeah, that's Joey showing you the average American diet. That was chubby Joey five years ago. Then Joey started eating more broccoli and Joey gave up animal products and crap. And these are pictures. Um, this guy goes around the world and buys the family a week's worth of groceries and takes a picture of them. Who do you want to go and visit? Who's got the most beautiful smiles? Yeah, I know where I want to go. So our bottom left, the poorest countries. Are they really poor? It depends on how we measure wealth. Australia, I have to tell you, I have the original picture from 10, 15 years ago. In Australia, there was actually the only fruit or vegetable on the table was one onion. So they've gotten better here. Look at that, they got some carrots there. But look at all the processed food. And the thing that's scary is these pictures, like from Mexico and Egypt, from 15 years ago, there wasn't all the Coca-Cola and all the processed stuff. All right. So, ROS, radical oxygen species, free radicals, oxidative stress, disease. You gonna eat bacon? You gonna eat with, with a Cheeto little tail? You're going to be in acidosis. You want to eat your fruits and veggies? You'll stay healthy in alkalosis and happy. Is there really a choice? And so half of your lab for seven days, you're going to make a diet change. And some of you are doing the one month challenge. You're going to add something to it for seven days. So for seven days, go for it. And yes, I know it is Thanksgiving. That is why the timing is what it is. It couldn't be any better. So this is one of your choices. Go for G-bombs for the week. Greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds every day. Doesn't have to be in one meal, but you could make a salad and take care of it in one meal. The seeds is seeds or nuts. This could be a handful of walnuts, just a handful. Berries, that includes cranberries. It is cranberry season, not the highly sugared. You can make it with real honey. All right and legumes, your greens, eat your greens, onions, onions or garlic. Um, so this is from Dr. Furman, if you're interested. Go with the no sugar challenge. Cut out all of your refined, all refined for seven days. Take the seven day vegan challenge. Take, right, cut out all animal products for seven days. Can you do it over Thanksgiving? That's a big one. You can still go, you can just be polite. Or you can do the rainbow, eat the rainbow every day. Now, at least five colors every day. Not one color on day one, red and orange on day two. You have to eat at least five different colors. Doesn't have to all be in one meal, but at least five colors and write down what you're doing each day. There's my cat Rocky, he's like, I'll just stick with green. That's him eating an avocado. His nose is green. He loves avocado. So does Shanti. Little war happens whenever the avocados. It's actually part of Rocky's 
vocabulary. He heard me say avocado and he's moving around behind me now. He knows his name and he knows the word avocado. All right, or just stop eating crap for seven days. Stop the carbonated drinks. And again, if you're doing a 30 day challenge, let's add something to it. Or if you're like, oh, I didn't, the fruit thing didn't work for me, let's do it for seven days. Seven days is a lot less than 30. And then I got to thinking, because there is another half to the lab. Before my glory days at Mount Hood, this is where the campus, that's our labs. Kaylee's probably up there. I had to cut all the kids out. Back in 2016, they're all shooting marshmallows at me before I could balance the marshmallows on my head. That's Kaylee, marshing, balancing a marshmallow on her nose six years ago. All right, I don't have Kaylee's permission for that, but you know, I'll deal with it. Before I went to the redwoods and talked to the fairies. Oh, not that far back. That's me and my twin brother, but before I was at Mount Hood, I was at Penn State and Duke. And what I studied was DNA, mutations, changes to the DNA. It doesn't mean it's a bad change, just changes. It could be caused by x-rays, could be caused by chemicals, could be caused by elements. Mad Hatter, mercury, could be caused by a virus. Smoking, gotta love this. People are still smoking. They pull their masks down, they actually make masks. Yeah, smoking causes bad changes to DNA. The sunshine does too, but not enough sunshine causes more. There's that whole balance and air, even breathing. Yeah, because the oxygen's greed, it causes changes. So where's the balance? Well, the biggest changes are crap, eating crappy food. There are biggest changes to our pH, as well as our causing these free radicals. Oh, but even bigger is your attitude. Having an attitude, you're gonna cause serious DNA stuff. So I started thinking, hmm, there's a relation. So all this, right? We lead to cancer and we lead to heart disease and we lead to, right, you're, she's probably like younger than all of you. You get wrinkly skin and all that stuff in your liver, your eyes, your kidneys, your joints are achy. Oh, and your immune system isn't working and you get a cold. Is it your DNA or is it your cell membranes? Oh, that's a whole nother talk. I should take my other classes, we'll talk about it. But this is a cool study that came out a couple years ago. There's studies, there's tons of these studies now coming out that your diet changes how your DNA wraps around the histones and changes what genes are expressed. So we've had a myth that's been perpetuated for 70 years that's all about your DNA. It's not about the DNA. It's about how, what parts of the DNA are activated. So just one example, so ferrophane, which is in, it's a molecule, every corner in these zigzags is a carbon. So it's a shorthand way of drawing big molecules. So broccoli, it's a big thing behind broccoli and cauliflower and red cabbage. Eat that red cabbage. That's part of your rainbow. The red cabbage is so yummy. Anyway, what happens is in these, you don't actually have the sulfurophane. You start with this big molecule here, and then you have an enzyme that gets activated. Oh, these, I call them the guardians of the genome. So they guard our genes, and they take away 63 genes in cancer, so the cancer cells can't grow. They suppress, they actually stimulate in our, in our cells to release tumor suppressor genes, to activate them so that they don't become cancer. So when you chew your food or you cut the food, it releases the enzyme. The enzyme breaks down the original molecule and makes it into sulforaphane. And the sulforaphane is what is this guardian of the genome. And so you are what you eat. There is no sulforaphane in the Big Mac, or you can't get in a pill. You can only get it from real food. So this is a fascinating study, came out of West China and looked at telomere length. So your telomeres are the end of your DNA. As your DNA, every time it gets copied, you lose a little bit. And then eventually your DNA is too short and it falls apart. That's not a good thing. 
And so they looked at Tilmerling, because we can do this now, and they looked at four diets. They looked at the gorilla diet or the whole food plant-based diet. They looked at the macho diet, which was pretty much the keto, paleo, whatever fad diet you want to call it. They looked at this highly, yeah, just dripping in oil and sugar and the Americanized Asian food that is not what Asian food is. And then he looked at what they call the high energy density diet, which is the crap diet we feed the kids in our schools. And guess which one? Actually, they found the Tilmer length increased. So it's been a myth. So once they found out about telomeres in the 50s and 60s, they estimated humans can only live to be 80 because their telomeres are shrinking. But it turns out they were wrong. We can actually lengthen our telomeres based on our diet. Or you can shrink them based on your diet. Nature or nurture, standard American diet, yeah. It actually increases how fast your telomeres are, are shrinking. The best shrinker of telomeres, oh, bacon, which is a class one carcinogen along with plutonium. So you wanna put some plutonium on your sandwich? You're like, I love bacon. Do you really? You can get over it because it's the number one shrinker of telomeres. Number one cancer, it's a, it's a class one carcinogen, guaranteed it will cause cancer, as well as sugary drinks and smoking. We all know smoking's bad for us. 1,442 genes were silenced by these. That's not a good thing. These were genes you, you probably needed. 28 of those were in your adipose, so your fat cells kind of went out of control. And so I was like, well, wait a minute, all these things, diet, diet's related to pH, because there's one more thing about this. So our diet affects our pH. Is our pH what's affecting our telomeres then and are causing this shift in our epigenetics? That's actually me thinking. Because the biggest thing that affects your telomeres turns out to be an attitude of gratitude. So let's move on to the next page to see. So does an attitude of gratitude change your pH? Because the number one cause of acidosis is stress. And we are wired that if we see a real stress, like that tiger, we are programmed to fight or run. And that's how our body is made. And so epinephrine, adrenaline is released from our adrenals and our body does what it needs to do. It's blood goes to our heart, our lungs, our, our muscles, and our digestive system shuts down. Our immune system shuts down when we're under stress. And another molecule is released, which is cortisol. Even when the stress only lasts for a moment in your mind, the cortisol gets released. It travels graciously, slowly to your liver. Problem is cortisol is hydrophobic. All of those corners and all those zigzags are carbons. Yes, there are some red oxygens, but it is pretty much all carbons. There is a ratio of carbons to oxygens. This doesn't have enough oxygens to like water. So it has a boat that carries it to the liver and the boat doesn't back up. The boat never goes backwards. Once you have the stress, even for a moment, and then you look over it, the cortisol already got released. And it goes to your liver and tells your liver to do all these things, including make more food. But you didn't need the food because this, this is two hours later. The stress is gone. And so you store it as fat. And meanwhile, your digestive system has been suppressed. Your immune system has been suppressed. The thing that's fascinating is we as humans are the only species that can turn on stress by a thought. All other species have to have a real stress. So your mind, allow your mind to blossom with thoughts that create beauty. Choose joy in your mind. So this is a book by Dr. Joe Dispenza that um, all of his books are amazing. He talks about this is you can either be in survival, cortisol, or in creation, joy, love. 
So, right, you learn all that, blah, blah, blah. So adrenaline, fight or flight, cortisol, fear, it's a big topic these days, lack of control, feeling judged, or you can collect and protect with the love hormones. And that's Olivia, one of my kids. Her mom was in my class. So she's saying, choose love. I choose love. This is the thing that's interesting. They've now done studies and looked at the vibrations that these give off and the vibrations of love and joy give off frequencies, shorter and faster wavelengths that activate DNA. Whereas fear, anger, they're low frequencies, long, slow wavelengths. They don't do the same thing. It's really simple. So, yes, you know where we're going. We are entering a stress-free zone. My fairy godmothers are very excited about this. This is actually uh, Hell's Canyon six years ago. First time I went there. So in Oregon, Eastern Oregon, looking over, um, we got a tip from fairy godmother where to camp. So the other half of your lab, you're going to choose for seven days, acidosis or gigolosis. Yes, it's back. Giggling for a week. Giggling until you're jiggling. And so this is in the summer when we were at my mom's and playing cards. And Brittany, you remind me of this because she was talking about, a lot of you talked about with your family, um, if you took the gigolosis uh, challenge last time with the gas laws, you pick it again. Giggling is amazing. Um, just doing silly stuff until you're giggling. Giggling all day for a week. For the whole week of Thanksgiving. Just imagine how wonderful that will be. And so, yeah, whenever we play cards with my mom, there's just something that happens. And usually somebody ends up on the floor laughing so hard. And you've all been there. And so that's one choice. Another choice, this fascinated me. So the biggest change of telomere length of all was not diet. It was service, service to others. So this is a new option that wasn't there before. It is to be of service for seven days, of service which they don't know that it was you. Maybe it's doing the dishes, it's what Joey does for me every day. Um, this is a really interesting study of depression. And they said they took these patients who were clinically, chronically depressed, and they said for three months, just do what makes you feel good. People said, okay. After three months, everybody in China was better. In the US, they were not, and why? Because the Americans did what made them feel good. They went shopping. They bought stuff. They went and worked out. They did the self-help stuff. They drank more water and they still were depressed. And what did they do in China? They did what made others feel, uh, feel good, feel happy. They did service. They got out of themselves and helped others. And then when they do these telomere studies, different study, the biggest change of all of telomere length of increasing your telomeres was service and gratitude. So these are people who helped me with my kids' class. Just did it, and they everybody would want to come back. Uh, so service lead to a higher pH. Pretty sure it does. And gratitude. It's another choice. So keeping a journal. It's all there in the handout. Saying grace every day. Kissing the cook giving a hug to the cook. That's my mom, my inspiration for my cooking. And that's my Shanti who will kiss the cook. She will follow the cook wherever they go. Um, and breathing does affect your pH. So we're not gonna go climb Mount Everest. That is the top of Mount Everest. That's where my cook, Pimba, he's here right now, but that's a picture of him on top of Everest. But remember that equilibrium equation, the CO2? It's there. So he actually sends himself to alkalosis. So when you go to high altitude, you're breathing heavier because there's not enough oxygen. So you're actually losing CO2. This shifts the whole thing to the left. It decreases your hydrogen because it's shifting backwards. And decrease in hydrogen increases your pH, but to a dangerous level. The problem is people who smoke, any kind of smoking, destroy their lungs. You no longer have the beautiful little grape aviola. You have this big grapefruit and the CO2 can't exchange. And so the CO2 from the respiration in your cells, it builds up. 
at CO2 buildup pushes us so you have high hydrogen ion. High hydrogen means a low pH. And stress changes your breathing. So stress is a double whammy. It changes your metabolism. It changes your breathing. It sends you into acidosis. And so meditation, because you're taking slow, long, luxurious breaths, calmly sends you into alkalosis. So it could be reading the Bible, could be music, gentle music some of you found that it could be a guided meditation if you're doing the 30-day meditation challenge then do the gratitude challenge if you're not and you want to try meditation you want to try something different it can be sitting it can be laying down it can be going for a walk it can be like me i do moving meditation um and always smiling that is the key so the choice is yours and you're making two choices one is a diet change and one is an attitude of gratitude. Meditation, giggles, gratitude, service. And get a friend to join you for the bonus point. All right. I can't wait to read your stories. Bye-bye.